Hey everyone, uh, we are starting into a new series. I'm excited about this series. It's called I Believe. Um, and what today what we're going to hit, and I want to let you know up front where we're going to ha- head, is kind of um, keep this in the back of your mind. Examine yourself. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, I'm going to ask some questions up front. How many of you would love to hear from God? Uh, how many of you would love to see him at work in your lives? to be led and and guided by him, experiencing his peace and his comfort. I mean, I think all of us, right, would would love to to know that or to be part of that. All of us would would love that, right? What we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about today is, is what it means to be about a follower of Christ, but examining ourselves as a disciple and, and walking out this close relationship so The end result is that we are seeing him at work. The end result is we are seeing his peace and his comfort in our lives. And I want to start with this, and I think it's really, really, really important, is what you believe matters. I want to repeat that. What you believe matters. What you believe actually guides your life. Example. So Lois and I have been kind of on this this healthy eating thing, right? Um, and and uh, it's got an end date. Thank goodness, it's t- like twenty days from now. And <laughs> and and I want to continue to eat healthy, but this is really restrictive. And and so we've been doing it. And here's here's the bottom line to that. We believe that eating healthy and exercising changes our lives. Now, so far, and this has nothing to do with bragging, it's not anything like that, but I, I, as a result of healthy eating, um, I've lost 10 pounds. Now, I, I needed to um, lose that 10 pounds, but I've lost 10 pounds. What's that evidence of? It's evidence. I believe that healthy eating is important. And if I believe it, then I choose to live out a lifestyle that supports that, right? And again, let me let me let me go through another example. I believe if we're intentional, in fact, numerous times people have asked me, you know, if you could do one thing over as a parent. So our children right now are Kyle's 32 and and Christina's 28. If you do our parenting all over again, what would you have done differently? And my answer is always the same. I'd have been more intentional. Not only from a spiritual standpoint, but from from a, a raising them and pouring into them in life standpoint, I would have been way more intentional. And I believe if you're intentional, and I believe if we were more intentional, and we are intentional now, even more intentional, as we are intentional, it changes something. I believe that that's true, so I'm going to be intentional, and it's the outcome of it is going to be different. I believe, and oftentimes we run, we run across this, all of us, and I think in our lives, is I believe if I if there's something that could be dangerous, that it, there's a risk factor, I have to weigh that in, right? I used to jump up on a roof. And, and in fact, I roofed many houses when I was younger, not many, a number of houses when I was younger. And I'd jump up on a roof, up and down the roof, get on the ladder, come down backwards, whatever, right? I don't do that now at the age that I am because there's more risk involved. I don't know if I got wiser or I'm actually not as coordinated or a combination of the both, right? But I, I, I understand that. So I believe that. And so I behave differently. So keep that in mind as we continue to continue to walk through this. So Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If you believe or if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe, there is that word, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You heard Pastor Eric use this, uh, these verses uh, numerous times over the last few weeks. And today we're going to look at these verses and go a little bit deeper. We're going to talk about what that means in, re- in, in relationship to our relationship with Jesus, our relationship with God. Now, I want to do something first here on the board. I think it's important. Um, we're going to put not a disciple, not a disciple. And then over here, we're going to put a disciple. All right. These are the two, two as far as relationship to God, these are the two sides, right? We either are not a disciple 
or we're a disciple. And why would we not be a disciple? Well, we just flat out may not believe, right? We just may not believe. Um, another reason is that um, we could believe, but we're choosing to reject. So we believe, but choose, but reject. We'll, we'll word it that way, but reject. So these two, we just flat out don't believe. There's not a God. I don't believe any of it. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. The second one, I believe, I believe there's a God. I believe he sent his son Jesus to die for my sins. Um, I believe that that exists. I believe all of what you say is true, but you know what? I want to live my own life and I'm rejecting that, right? Or the third one, and it's, this encompasses quite a bit, um, maybe just not aware, so maybe you were never exposed to Christianity, right? You, you never, uh, that was something that wasn't a part of your life, never exposed to it. And so you're just not aware. You've never, you've heard about Christianity, you've heard about church, but it's kind of somewhere else. And you've never really been confronted with, man, there's this choice out here to believe or not to believe, right? And over here on this side, we have the disciple and they are, a follower, they're a follower of Christ, and they believe. So we're followers of Christ, and we believe. So those are kind of the two sides, right? And here's the truth, and, 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 and I, want us to, I want us to walk through this, and I think it's important that, like it or not, we're being discipled by something or someone. Like it or not, we're being discipled by something or some, someone. So last week, uh, we were out on a boat. We were on vacation, and we got to stay on this boat that was kind of out in the Gulf a little ways. And we had to take a smaller boat, boat out to it. It was a little whaler. And this little whaler is a 14-foot boat. had a little canopy covering it. But on the back of this was a motor, and they had kind of rigged it. So they had a piece of PVC attached to the motor, and that's how you would steer the boat. So you'd start it, and your throttle was up here and to the right. But as far as steering, you had this piece of PVC. Well, we're on our way out to the boat to stay on it a couple of nights. And partway out, the PVC just falls off. Right, and all of a sudden the boat we're in is doing circles. Right, we're going in circles, and uh, I jump up and I get to the back, and I had to reattach that PVC to gain control of the boat. Truth of the matter is, I was driving, and then I wasn't. And I think sometimes in our spiritual lives, right, sometimes life wags us. I call it life wagging us. But it's it's that that you know we some we're being discipled we're being led we're following something like it or not something is discipling us and if we were to follow each other around for a week i think it'd be pretty obvious wouldn't it it'd be fairly obvious what it is that well that's leading us or what it is that we're following so if i woke up with you or you woke up with me on monday morning and you spent all day monday till i went to bed at night and you did the same thing tuesday and wednesday and thursday the whole week right at the end of the week, what we're going to discover is what each of us is really being discipled by or who or what each of us is following after. Question is, who are you following? Or who are you a disciple of? Or what are you a disciple of? I want to remind you, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you do what? You believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, this is going to throw off a little bit what we said earlier, because as we dive into what this word believe means, you're going to see there's more to it than, than meets the eye. In the Greek, that word is pistio, pistio. And what that means is that, that I have faith in, or I have placed my trust, and I have entrusted myself to, right? So that believe, not that I just believe this through. I actually am entrusting myself. So a great example of this. How many of you are familiar with the trust fall, right? The trust fall. So somebody stands here, right? And they, and the, for instance, if I was doing it, right, there'd be somebody behind me and I trust and I just go, that's a great illustration of what that word believe means. It's to entrust myself. And, and um, what we need to understand too is, is we are entrusting. So as a disciple, we are entrusting ourselves to 
God, believing in our heart and entrusting ourselves to God. And if we look at these verses in Romans, um, we believe with our heart, right? And then we profess with our mouth. Now, here's the thing that all of us have walked through the influences in our life. So an example would be great. So if we look at us as elementary students, right? So we're second, third, fourth grade, whatever, right? Are there influences in our lives? And all of it, there is, right? There's influences in our lives. And man, all of a sudden, all the kids are doing this. And so you want to be part of it. All the kids are doing this. You want to be part of it. The kids start talking a certain way. You start talking a certain way. They wear certain uh, shoes. I remember at that age, tennis shoes and, and certain people would buy certain tennis shoes. And man, I wanted those tennis shoes. I thought they were the coolest tennis shoes ever. Hit middle school and high school and there's other influences. Always these influences are things that we can follow. What is, again, we'll use that word discipling, right? Us, what, who or what are we following? As we get to adults, it really doesn't change. I remember, I remember Lois and I were living in a city um, early on in our marriage, and it was kind of an affluent area that we were living in. It felt really like, and you've heard this term before, it keeping up with the Joneses. People cared what kind of car you drove. People cared what kind of clothes you wore. People cared what kind of purse you carried, what kind of glasses you had. And it was, in all honesty, exhausting. In fact, when we moved to Midland, we were so, that was one of the things that just attracted us to the Midland area, is it just didn't seem at that point in time to be as important. That just didn't govern, at least the people we were hanging out with, didn't seem to govern their lives like it did with where we moved from. But we see these influences in our lives all the time, right? I bought cars because somebody around me was excited about cars. And I got excited about what they were excited about, and I bought a car. Recently, we've had some people around us that are really into identifying birds. They're into birding, right? And in fact, uh, one of the people from the church, they bought us uh, this, this really this really cool bird feeder and other people have showed me these apps. Now I got an app on my phone. I know what kind of species of bird is making noises within like a hundred, 150 feet of me. Right. I, we, why? Because I've been influenced. we always have these influences in our lives. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but there was a movie that came out in 2020. It's called the social dilemma. Um, very interesting movie. And it talked about, in fact, the, the, the creators of this movie were people that had been execs in Google and in Facebook. They had heavy influence into how those things were put together and the scripts were written. And what ended up happening or what they found out and what this movie is about is the way that those, um, those different, either search engines or again, take like Facebook or Amazon or any of those kinds of, of um, techie type things. And when you begin to look at something, so you look at something on Facebook or you do a search for something you're going to buy on Amazon, or you look up something on Google, right? It, watches you. It pays attention. And then it begins to feed you more of what it is you've been looking at. So if I look up a certain news story, don't be surprised if you continue to do that. It's going to continue to feed you more information and more stories that are very, very similar. If you look up a certain product to buy, I've had this happen numerous times, right? I'll look up something and all of a sudden it's showing up on my Facebook feed or I continue to see that um, in, as I'm searching through Amazon, I continue to see those things offered in, in what I could be buying. Why? They know they can influence, right? So we have these influences all around us. It's just part of our culture, right? Do you know that four hours and 30 cents, 37 minutes, four hours and 37 minutes each day, the average person spends on their phone? That quickly adds up to one day every week, six days every month, and 70 days per year. You tell me, right? That influences us, right? So we have all these outside influences, yet... We want to be a disciple, and we're asking. We, our heart is that we would be disciple. We'd be a disciple of God, but we've allowed, allowed these other influences, right, to impact us. So let me throw through, go through some really quick hypotheticals. What if culture convinced us that being successful were the utmost importance? What if culture convinced us that being the best at something would be a great goal? Whatever. What if culture? Uh, convinced us that whatever you set your mind to, you can accomplish? What if culture convinced us that working hard, if you work hard, that just good things will always happen? What if culture convinced us that 
uh, attaching God somehow to our life was a good thing and makes you a good person with good values and good ethics. What if culture convinced us that, well, we should just live our lives alone and whatever you believe, you believe, and whatever I believe, I believe, and that's all okay? Hmm. I could go on, right? But you kind of get the point. We're influenced. We're being discipled by something. John Mark Comer, uh, this is a John Mark Comer book, um, or quote from his book. And, and I want, I want um, practicing the way is the name of the book. And I want to read this quote to you. It says this, for those of us who desire to follow Jesus, here's the reality you must turn and face. If we're not being intentionally formed by Jesus himself, then it's highly likely we're being unintentionally formed by someone or something else. I want to read that again. For those of us who desire to follow Jesus, here is a healthy or a reality we must turn and face. If we're not being intentionally formed by Jesus himself, then it's highly likely that we're being unintentionally formed by someone or something else. We're going to take a journey over the next few weeks, and I want to invite you to be part of this journey. Um, and if you're willing, what it's going to describe is what it means to be a disciple or a follower. And I love the word that John Mark Comer uses, apprentice of Jesus, what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. If we're going to take this journey. We've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to examine ourselves. I find it interesting. Um, the word disciple or apprentice, I love how John Mark Cormer does it. It's used 269 times in the New Testament. Isn't that something? The word disciple is used 269 times. The word Christian is used three. Hmm. Uh, again, uh, this is another quote from Michael Berkheimer in the book, Lincoln's Christianity. It says this, one who believes that Jesus Christ was divine and part of the Trinity that Christ died for our sins, for the sins of the world, and that faith is the doctrine is necessary to gain salvation. That's Christianity. Let me read it again. Definition of Christianity. One who believes that Jesus Christ was divine and part of the Trinity, that Christ died for the sins of the world, and that faith in this doctrine is necessary to gain salvation. I mean, if we, each of us were to listen to that, we go, that's so true. That's true. And it's kind of this foundational this foundation to our faith that we're familiar with. Here's the problem with that. It's true, but there's more. It includes nothing about following Jesus or being a disciple or being an apprentice with the intent to give our life over to him. It's a belief about something rather than an entrustment to Jesus. So if I, a believer, or a disciple, or an apprentice, if my aim is to be with Jesus in order to become like him and to live the way that Jesus lives, the way that he lived, then any other way of living, right, would mean that I'm not a disciple. Mm. Listen to that. So if as a believer or a disciple or an apprentice, whatever, however you want to, followers of Christ, right, if our aim is to be with Jesus in order to become like him and live the way that he lived, then any other kind of living, if I chase any other kind of living, if any other kind of living is governing my life, then I'm not a disciple. Jesus never used the label Christian. Isn't that interesting? He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must do what? You guys know this. Must do what? Follow me. Please understand, Jesus wants us to be a Christian. Hmm. But he doesn't want us to believe about him. He wants us to entrust our lives to him. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we talked about this. Examine ourselves. Listen to this. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. I want to read to you from another version. This is the Amplified Version. And what the Amplified Version does is it tends to expound on certain words or concepts. It's a, it's a direct um, quote, word-for-word word quote, but it expands on those words a little bit. Listen to this. 
Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me, or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit? And I don't believe this is a one-time evaluation. I believe that we wake up every morning and we evaluate ourselves and examine ourselves to make sure that we are where we need to be. Now, I want to, this is very important. Guys, this is not, this doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we don't struggle. It doesn't mean that um, we don't have days that are just really difficult days and we do things wrong. What it means is we are truly disciples or followers that we truly believe and have entrusted ourselves to Jesus. So when I fail, I ask for forgiveness. When I struggle, I ask for God's help. It's so important that as we walk out our lives, that we do this self-examination over and over and over, not to, you know, not for this, I should be feel guilty or I should feel bad. That's not the point. It's to examine ourselves to make sure we are where we are, where we need to be, and that we're truly following Christ, that we haven't been sidetracked or distracted into following or being discipled by someone else. I want to I want to talk about this a little bit what it means to be a disciple. Jesus was of course a teacher, right? And in and in fact, um he was referred to by the disciples as rabbi. If we look in Mark 9, Peter says Jesus rabbi. If we look in John 1, um this is some followers disciples of John the Baptist, they refer to Jesus as rabbi. If we look at John 149, that was what John 138. If we look at John 149, Nathaniel says to him rabbi. If we look in John 4, 31, in the meantime, his disciples said to him or urged him saying, rabbi. Now we know that Jesus is our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Messiah, right? Our risen Savior. We know that, but he was also a rabbi, a teacher. In fact, when they would talk about Jesus as a rabbi, he was their master or their teacher. And I want to walk through what it meant in that day. I think it helps us understand a little bit more even what God is looking for from us as disciples. So when you were around five or whatever in the, in the, in the uh, Jewish culture, you would enter into school, and that was called um, a bet sefer. And you would be in the bet sefer through age 11 or 12, and it was hooked to the synagogue. It was probably either taught by a scribe or a teacher, those classes would be, and you'd be studying the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Believe it or not, by age 11 or 12, those children had the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy memorized, right? Now, if you were kind of uh, among the best of the brightest, your parents wanted you to stay and you wanted to stay, then you would request to stay and then you would become part of of the next uh, stage. Again, you'd enter around the age of 12 and it was called the Bet Midrash. And that was the house it was, that can be translated as the house of learning. Um, the the uh, Bet Sefer was, re, was actually the house of the book or the Torah. But at age 12, you would, ex- you would enter this house of learning and, and you would continue to memorize and study the Old Testament. Again, believe it or not, by age 17, you had the whole Old Testament memorized. After that, at this point, there were some choices and many would choose to go home, get, they may get married, they may work on the farm, or if there was a trade that their family uh, maybe uh, was a part of, they might learn that trade and continue on with their lives. But the best and the brightest, and those who really wanted to be part of the religious um, and, and continue to study in that area of religion, they would then apprentice or they would disciple under a rabbi. They had to ask, they had to to seek out a rabbi, somebody that they were attracted to his teachings, and they would approach him and say, I want to be part of what it is that you're doing. And they would do that. And if the rabbi probably would ask them questions, kind of grill them on things, and if he had room, he might add one or two or whatever, but they would become disciples of that rabbi. And you know what they would do at that point in time? They'd leave home. They would travel with this rabbi, with him all the time. They wanted to be with him. They wanted to learn from him 
They wanted to become like him, and they wanted to do as the rabbi did. Hmm. As disciples, they wanted to be with him. They wanted to be like him, to learn from him, and to do as he did. Listen to these words in Luke 9, 23 from Jesus. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to follow me, this is from the Amplified Version, as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering, or perhaps dying because of faith in me. Wow. A disciple. Truly following, believing, and trusting our lives to God. The Son of God, Jesus invites us to be his disciple. And and guys, you know this. This is true. But did the requirement change to be a disciple of Christ? Is the requirement to be a disciple the same as it was when Jesus walked up to Peter and John and said, follow me? It is. It's the same. We are to be disciples, to follow him, denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily and following him. So the question this week, and the self-evaluation question, and I think it's really important, am I a disciple? Am I a disciple? Am I a follower? Am I an apprentice of Jesus? And if I am, am I, if I am, am I being, am I with Jesus? Am I becoming like Jesus? Am I learning from Jesus? And am I acting like Jesus acted? Am I doing the things that Jesus did? Now, please understand that Jesus is the son of God, right? The Messiah. We aren't Jesus, but we are to be with him. We are to learn from him, becoming like him, and our actions should begin to look an awful lot like Jesus' actions. The question that can be confusing, and we can associate with this, is it ends up being doing rather than being. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. You'll remember, Jesus came to his disciples. And what did he say when he came to those disciples? When he came to Peter and John, what did he say? He said, come, follow me. And it's the same question that's being asked of you and I this morning. I want to remind you, and I want to go back to Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart, your core, that you believe and are justified and is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Is your heart, is my heart turned toward him? Remember, you're following someone. So the question as we examine ourselves this morning is, where do you find yourself? And maybe, just maybe you find yourself this morning with this growing desire to take your faith a little more seriously. Or maybe, This morning, you want to be a little more intentional in your walk with God. Maybe maybe you've hit a plateau in your walk. Maybe you feel stuck. And this morning, you want to get unstuck in taking that next step with Jesus and that relationship. Maybe your desire is to close that gap between what your life is and what is truly life that Jesus has for you. I want to invite you into this journey. Jesus didn't invite people to be Christians. Jesus didn't invite people to convert to Christianity. He didn't ask people to agree with his beliefs. He asked people to follow him, to be with him, to become like him, to learn from him, and that their actions would be actions that looked an awful lot like Jesus. Are you ready to take that journey? Are you ready to take that journey with us this morning? By the way, and you'll hear more. This is what life in the kingdom of God looks like. 
This is what life in the kingdom of God really looks like. Life as a disciple. So here's what I want to kind of close with, and I think it's so important. And I want, I want us to, to, this is our assignment for the week, is I want you to think about these things. I really do. I want you to think about these things. It's so and so important. First thing is, are you being, are you setting aside time being with Jesus? Are you being with, are you spending time with Jesus? The second thing, are you listening and learning from Jesus? And the last thing, are your actions like Jesus. Now, this is what I want us to think about. So as you walk out the rest of this week, what I want you to be thinking about are those three things, just, just to begin to dwell on those and to ask that self-examination and ask those questions. And then, hmm, and then what we're going to do over the next three weeks is we're going to walk through each one of those. Next week, we're going to talk about what it means to be with Jesus. And please understand, this is one thing before I close. That's one thing that's very important. This is not to make you feel guilty. I don't want you to, um, to walk out of here if you're listening online. I don't want you to, wow, Gene, that, yeah, boy, this thing between a, not a disciple and disciple, now you've just made me feel really bad about myself. This is a thing that I want you to jump into. I could, I could literally each week, say some things that maybe stir you a little bit, but leave you comfortable. And guys, as I've walked through this and preparing for this for the last number of weeks, I'm convicted. And I, I have to share with you what I believe is truth from the word of God. He's calling us to be disciples, apprentices, to be followers of him. And it's an all in. So I want to invite you to this journey together with me. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for the truth from your word. God, would you please guide us in this journey that we would be authentic and real as we examine ourselves. God, would you grow us in this? Reveal those things in our hearts, maybe things that we've centered our lives around that aren't of you. God, if you need to convict us, convict us. If we need to surrender some more, then God, guide us in that, please. We want to be, our hearts to be disciples, followers, apprentices of Jesus. Guide us in this. As we walk through this next week, would you guide our minds as we pray and as we come to you, desiring to be followers of Christ. And God, for what you've done this morning, how you've led and guided us, thank you. And for what you're going to do, God, we give you praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, love to have you come back and join us in person next week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you.